flying wing was unlike any aircraft that had yet been developed. It had no fuselage, no long central body such as were to be found on all other aircraft. It had no tail, no orthodox vertical fin or rudder, no horizontal stabilizers or elevators as were found on ordinary airplanes. It was purely and simply a long, slippery-looking wing. It carried its cargo and its crew inside that wing. It employed different techniques of control. More about that in a moment. One could stand upright in the wing, and this reporter did so when he worked on the story more than 30 years ago. The pilot, co-pilot, engineer, and bombardier were all housed inside the wing. it flew. Oh my, how it flew. I recall the day I first flew alongside it high above Muroc Dry Lake in California's Mojave Desert. The test pilot in the wing had instructed us to meet him at a certain point over the desert. You, he said, must be at 12,000 feet, and we'll be at 10,000, 2,000 feet below you. This is necessary, he added, if you are to see us. The wing, after all, looks like nothing more than a knife edge as you see it coming towards you in the sky. That is, if you see it. About 30 years ago, this reporter walked along this runway, much as I am right now. This is the Hawthorne Airport near Los Angeles, a relatively small municipal airport. I had come here at that time to report on a radically different airplane that promised to be the most exciting advance in military aviation since the development of the B-17 Flying Fortress and the B-29 in World War II. This is the home of the Northrop Corporation's aircraft division. They built airplanes here, they still do. And the aircraft I had come to see was the uh, massive flying wing. It was called the B-49 by the U.S. Air Force. It was the product of the genius of John K. Northrup and his crew of engineers who had brought it to a point of development where it had been selected by the United States Air Force as the next generation bomber, the replacement for the B-29 that had carried the air war against Japan. The flying wing dated back many years. The first developmental work was done by John K. Northrup, Theodore von Karman, and William Sears. John Northrop and his fellow engineers and dedicated workers believed in their dream of a flying wing. They designed and built progressively better and larger versions until they brought it to a point where it was submitted to the United States Air Force as a possible replacement for the B-29. It flew in competition with these aircraft, the B-36s, and it won the fly-off. Orders were given to manufacture the first aircraft. A number of various versions were built and flown. Well, my interest began about, uh, oh, 23 years ago, when I was active in the air, aerospace industry. Our chief test pilot, Max Stanley, who had had a tremendous amount of previous aircraft experience, was making a trip back from, from uh, Albuquerque to Los Angeles to Hawthorne to our plant there and he and two very knowledgeable observers saw a UFO which could not be explained by any of the techniques that we knew then or know now. They were able to keep this object under observation for a period of about 20 minutes and of course with people of that character the chance of any hoax or any misleading statements or anything of this sort just simply doesn't exist. These were top technicians who had the opportunity firsthand. Personally, I have never seen a UFO or had any contact with anyone who has other than Mr. Stanley. But I had complete and have complete confidence in him, and I know what he reported was actually there. Well, starting with that interest then, 
it became a natural thing to read up on what I could here and there in the other place. And my belief in the fact that there are UFOs, so-called, has been reinforced through the years by what I've read in great incentive to believe, uh, which occurred in 1950. So that's about the size of it. Well, you know, it really seems like these UFOs move in very strange patterns. They're able to hover, almost standing still, and then zoom off. It seems as if they must be utilizing some other form of energy that perhaps we don't know about. Now, in terms of our present, you know, aerodynamic technology, do you feel that we're utilizing all that we can? The aircraft are thoroughly modern and up-to-date based on our present knowledge. But there is absolutely no question in the world but what there is not only a source of power of which we're not acquainted, but there is also a source of propulsion which we're not acquainted. Because the UFO seem to have unlimited power, which perhaps could we might obtain if we develop uh, uh, fusion. Fusion power uh, is more or less goes on forever. Fission that we're using now utilizes the, the elements to a certain extent, but fusion recreates the material that's used. And perhaps a, fuse, a small fusion power plant would give you the power necessary. But the, the propulsion of these UFOs is unique. Their ability to hover, their ability to accelerate very rapidly, their ability to to move at very high speeds, very much higher than anything that we have achieved even with our supersonic aircraft. All of these things, and particularly interestingly without sonic booms and the things that we don't like about our supersonic aircraft, all of these things indicate a type of propulsion which is unique, different than anything we know anything about, and which would be of tremendous value if we could develop it and use it. And that's the reason I feel with a number of others who have studied it that it is a subject which deserves the highest type of scientific study and at an early date. The advantages to be gained are perfectly enormous. Well, since you have designed a number of aircraft since the early days and throughout the war, such as the flying wing, would you say that flying saucers are aerodynamically sound? I don't believe they are aerodynamically powered. I don't think that there is any aerodynamic uh, particular value to their shapes. They come in a number of different shapes, all the way from a flattened sort of pumpkin shape, flattened sphere like a pumpkin, to elongated sort of cigar shapes, to the well-known flying saucer shape, which consists of a saucer with another inverted on the top of it. And uh, this type, uh, accounts for about 50%, but the flight characteristics of all of the different shapes are similar. In other, all, in other words, they've all been seen to accelerate rapidly, to be able to stop, to be able to turn rapidly, to be able to hover at will anywhere they want to go, so that the type of suspension, propulsion, whatever it is, that enables them to behave in the fashion they do is something that we simply have no technical background for at the present time. Mr. Northrop, how do you feel about the general ridicule that people are accorded that are into the study or believe in UFOs? Well, there's great, there has been a great deal of ridicule directed to the subject of UFOs, and probably rightly so to a certain extent, because probably 85 to 90 percent of the sightings of UFOs are not really unidentified flying objects. In other words, there is an answer to approximately 90% of the sightings that are made which correspond to the present techniques that we have. There remains a 10% to 15% number which cannot be explained by any of our present science. So that there's a natural reason to a certain extent for ridicule. And don't forget that the Wright brothers and uh, Fulton and everybody, the man who invented the first steam engine, all were ridiculed. They didn't want to leave the horses or the buggies or anything of that sort. So it's a natural thing for humans to ridicule something that they don't understand. 
but the subject of UFOs has has pulled in the serious study of many highly competent technical people. Many doctors of science have studied and fully believe in UFOs. And the number of these is sufficiently great and their reputation is sufficiently high so that they're really, in my humble estimation, there's no room left for ridicule. It just doesn't belong in this subject if we're talking about genuine UFOs. And how long do you feel it will be before we are flying in UFOs? <laughs> well, this probably is a $64 question without a question of a doubt. I think it depends a great deal on how rapidly we take them seriously and how soon we really set up scientific a, a, a scientific study team to work on the subject. We have uh, records of thousands and thousands of sightings, and those could be correlated and arranged in a suitable fashion by the use of modern computers so that we could probably learn a great deal that we don't understand now simply by that type of a study whether that would lead us to a solution of what the power is and what the propulsion method is, I simply don't know. It can be anywhere from 10 years to 10,000, as far as I can see right now. But I do believe that it's something that is realistic, something that is tremendously valued, something that we ought to study as soon and as rigorously as it can possibly be arranged for. Well, what happened when you had your fly off, your competition? General McNarney, who was the chief of the Air Force, walked into my office the morning in late June of 1948 and said, you have won the competition. Here is an order for 35 additional aircraft. And I took a big breath and said, oh, well, that's wonderful. And he said, that's only a drop in the bucket. We probably will need between 200 and 300 of these airplanes. The Air Force had previously put the B-35 through a series of acceptance tests. Actually, it went through twice because we had a accident, a fatal accident during the first final checkout, and the airplane was required to complete the whole routine again after that time and the order for the additional airplanes came as a final approval, you might say, of the design, winning the competition. There was great excitement at the Northrop factory. The dream had come true. The flying wing was on its way. What happened next has come to be regarded by those who were interested as one of the great mysteries of American aviation for suddenly the contracts for the flying wing were canceled. The aircraft themselves, every last one of them, were ordered destroyed, and the order came from the U.S. government. And they were destroyed, each and every one of them. There is no example of the B-49 flying wing in the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, nor is it in the Smithsonian Institution. Now, what happened to the flying wing? Why was the government contract to build it suddenly canceled? Was it a good aircraft, or was it a faulty design? Why did the government order all the aircraft destroyed? In search for an answer to those and other questions, we have talked with many of the men involved in the design and testing of the B-49 flying wing. We have learned of five men who flight tested the wing during the developmental phase. Two of them are dead. They died in the crash of a flying wing in 1949. The remaining three are retired Air Force General Robert L. Cardenas, retired Air Force Colonel Russ Schley, and retired Northrop test pilot Max Stanley. Max Stanley, you flew the uh, the flying wing. What do you think of it? Well, I um, I flew the flying wing, both the B-35 and the B-49 from the first flight of each airplane on through its entire program. 
And I felt that uh, the airplanes could be described as normal airplanes. And from the standpoint of, of its flying qualities, the field by the pilot, what it required to fly the airplane, uh, no special skills were needed. And I thought that it was just a very fine flying machine. There has been statements made that uh, the aircraft was not as stable as it might be, that it would not have made a good bombing platform because it seemed to yaw, that is, kind of move from side to side in the air. Was that accurate? Well, to a certain extent, yes. The airplane uh, 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 was somewhat deficient in uh, directional stability. However, the Minneapolis Honeywell people developed what we call Little Herbert, mm -hmm. a uh, stability augmentation system that essentially corrected this problem. And I think that when you talk about the airplane being a suitable bombing platform, you should, you should keep in mind that it was subjected to a very intense uh, uh, series of tests to determine its suitability as a bombing platform. It was flown by both the Northrop pilots and by the military pilots, and the conclusion of these tests was that it was a suitable bombing platform. It was acceptable. It flew, as I understand, nonstop uh, from uh, Muroc, now Edwards Air Force Base, to Washington at one time. Did you make that flight? Yes. Yeah, so well, I was, I was uh, what they call an observer pilot. The, actually, the flight was made under the auspices of the uh, Air Force, and the uh, pilot in command was an Air Force pilot. Retired Air Force General Robert L. Cardenas yep. recalls his I test flights. CG. It was rather heavy on the nose wheel. Uh, once you got airborne, again, it was sensitive in pitch, but not overly sensitive, you know, not a problem. Just sensitive, you had to be aware of it, uh, not over control, in other words. You felt, you felt comfortable with it? Oh, I felt comfortable. Uh, first flight, you know, you make, you learn about it, and uh, no, no real problem. Then once you were airborne, it was actually a pleasurable airplane to fly perform remarkably, I think, when you consider that it, this was uh, over 30 years ago, and it flew from uh, then Muroc to Washington, and I think it was four hours and 20 minutes, which is even pretty good time for today's airplanes. What altitude was it? Uh, it was flown uh, from, uh, as I recall, initially at 30,000 feet, and we gradually increased altitude to around 40,000 feet. And that also is, compares with what is right. being flown today, does it not? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Well, as a professional test pilot, you had no, no reservations about that, about the flying wing then. You, you felt it was a, a dependable, uh, well-designed aircraft, did you? Uh, yes, very definitely. The airplane, uh, uh, I'm speaking of the B-49 now, mm -hmm was uh, essentially uh, problem-free. Do you believe uh, that continued research and development on the, the wing would have been worthwhile? Uh, the R&D program would have had to been oriented towards the development of what now exists, digital flight control, fly-by-wire, which was not capable of being developed in that time. In other words, Mr. Northrop had a beautiful concept that was probably 20 years ahead of its time. And, and I gotta make clear that I have never said it was unstable. It was marginally stable. I say it's stable, not unstable. Marginally stable about the vertical axis, or yaw, and about the lateral axis, or pitch. A lot of Retired Air Force Colonel Russ Schley. It had certain shortcomings. And, uh, and advantages as well. Um, as far as it being a uh, bombing platform, uh, the bombs were not stable when they came out of the uh, Bombay, and, um, and we never did get uh, very good accuracy with the airplane. From a stability standpoint, uh, uh, there still needed further development. Did you, uh, did you feel at that time that uh they were on the road to solving those problems of uh, stability? Oh, I think anything could be solved, uh, given enough effort, time, and money. Um, in this particular case, uh, 
certainly it could have been solved. Forty years ago, Hugo R. Pink, now manager of the test and evaluation aircraft group for Northrop, worked on the flying wing. We asked him how he felt about the aircraft. Uh, the airplane uh, needed a stability augmenter, and uh, one was being developed and was quite successful before the program was canceled. So the, uh, the problem that uh, the airplane had had been solved. And with, of course, with the equipment that we have today, it would be duck soup. I think we'd, we'd have a much more efficient air transport aircraft today if we had to continue the wing development. D.G. McNeil today is manager of the Advanced Production Aircraft Group programs at Northrop. He has strong memories of the wing 40 years ago. You believed in it? We believed in it. Didn't have any questions in your own mind no about questions. its uh, flying ability? No questions. On the basis of what we've heard, the flying wing seems to have been a structurally sound, potentially highly useful aircraft for the U.S. Air Force, probably capable of fulfilling its role as the next generation bomber. So, what happened to it? 85-year-old John Knudsen Northrop, the man responsible for its design, an engineer who has perhaps had his hand in the design of more American aircraft than anyone else, tells the story for the first time. Well, it's a very strange story, and perhaps difficult to believe, but it certainly is seared into my memory, and I'm quite sure I can give you the absolute facts as they occurred. The same day that General McNarney, who was the chief the military chief of the Air Forces came to my office with that additional order for 35 airplanes, which he said was a drop in the bucket as far as the ultimate order was concerned. Mr. Millar and I were requested to visit Mr. Symington. At that meeting, he lectured us rather lengthily on the difficulties of a secretary for air in keeping things in hand and told us that he did not want to sponsor any new aircraft companies entering the business and having to be supplied with business over the years and that he wanted us without question to merge with Consolidated Baltic, which was then operating a government-owned plant in Fort Worth, building the B-36 as a competitor for the B-35 or the B-49. After the lengthy diatribe on Mr. Simonson's part, I said, Mr. Secretary, what are the alternatives to this demand you are making of our merger with Consolidated Voltee? He said, alternatives? You'll be goddamn sorry if you don't. General McNarney said, oh, Mr. Secretary, you don't mean the way that, that the way it sounds. And Mr. Simonson said, you're damn right I do. Well, this was a rather staggering termination of the meeting. Seeking confirmation of John Northrop's recollections, we talked to Richard Millar, who in 1949 was chairman of the board at Northrop. Mr. Millar, what happened at that meeting with Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Mr. Symington, the one that Mr. Northrop's already told us about? We were, in effect, directed uh, to negotiate or work out a merger with Nor Northrop and Convair. Jack Northrop asked the question, uh, what if we don't merge? And Mr. Simon was quick to reply that we'd be damn sorry if we didn't. Uh, we were told to get together with Mr. Odlum to work out a basis of merger. Uh, I might say parenthetically that when Mr. Simonian said that uh, 
in effect, we, we must do it. I'd be sorry if we didn't. General McCartney spoke up and he said, as I recall, Mr. Simon, you don't mean that, do you? And Mr. Simon said, in effect, yes, you damn right I do. And Mr. Millar and I had nothing in the world to do except to visit Floyd Adam, who was the monetary head at that time for Consolidated Baltee, and talk to Mr. Adam about a, a merger. Unfortunately, neither Mr. Millar nor I remember the terms that Mr. Adlam offered us. We felt them grossly unfair to Northrop because of the fact that we had all the business. They had none. Nothing substantial, nothing that came out of that and that would encourage the belief that we were within miles of uh, any kind of an agreement as to the relative values of the two stocks. We seemed to be so far apart that there was no point in having any further conversations. Was there any activity at the Convair plant at that time? It, it said that the Fort Worth plant, I think practically none. Uh, it was virtually empty. You did not accept Mr. Odlum's offer, I take it? No, we did not accept Mr. Odlum's offer, and we didn't feel that we could in fairness do so. So what happened? I got a telephone call a few days later for Mr. Symington. He said, I am canceling all your flying wing aircraft. And I said, oh, Mr. Secretary, why? And he said, I've had an adverse report and hung up. And that was the last time I ever talked to him and the last time we could ever reach him by phone or any other way. Did he give the contract to someone else? He continued the construction of the B-36 by Consolidated Volte in Fort Worth. So, in fact, the contract was taken away from you and given to Consolidated because you had refused to merge with Consolidated as you were ordered to do by the government. Is that accurate? That is absolutely accurate. We were saying to ourselves, we wonder what's going to happen now. In other words, uh, we're going to find out if Mr. Simon was bluffing. Well, he wasn't. The contract was canceled quickly. Uh, and as part of the cancellation, uh, instructions were issued to destroy the seven airplanes in various stages of construction uh, out on the apron of the plant and those airplanes were destroyed in front of the employees and everybody that had their heart and soul in it. Uh, uh, no reason was given for the extraordinary uh, order. Uh, no explanation uh, was forthcoming as to why at least they didn't save a one or two for continued experimental flights study. The order was very firm, destroy them and destroy them immediately. It was a very bitter experience to say the least. The villain in the death and destruction of the B-49 flying wing, according to John Northrup and Richard Millar, would be the then Secretary of the Air Force, Stuart Symington. Editorial fairness demands that Mr. Symington tell his side of the story at this time. We invited him to do so, speaking to us only through his secretary. The former Air Force civilian chief declared that he never did that sort of thing and declined to appear in this report. Mr. Northrup, in reading your testimony before the House Committee on Armed Services during their 1949 B-36 hearings, I find you were asked, in effect, if you had any knowledge or knew of any Northrop officer who had been told that Northrop's business would suffer if it failed to merge with Consolidated. And you answered, I have no such knowledge. And you were asked of Mr. Odlum, 
or Mr. Symington ever made such a statement to you, and you answered, no, sir. And you agreed with the attorney at that time that such a statement would not be truthful. What is your reaction to that now? My reaction is that under pressure of the life or death of Northrop Corporation, I committed one of the finest jobs of perjury that I've ever heard. You did not tell the truth. I did not tell the truth. And the reason for doing that was? The reason for doing that, that was fear of the secretary, the air secretary, Mr. Symington, fear of his complete obliteration of Northrop Aircraft Incorporated, which was struggling with what little was left of the business of aircraft manufacture after he had canceled the flying wing venture in toto. How does it happen, Mr. Northrop, that for 31 years this story has not been told? The reason the story has not been told for that length of time is the same as the initial reason for my perjury. And it was the fear of the company or the company management that any intimation of this circumstance would result in a complete cancellation and an obliteration of the company. Mr. Millar, while you were chairman of the board and after the cancellation of the B-49 contract, did you have any fear of reprisal that uh, might be uh, suffered by Northrop at the hands of the Air Force if in any way the Secretary of the Air Force uh, might be offended, might be questioned? Well, the only f honest answer I can give to that is yes. Uh, and it was a pretty widespread feeling that uh, Northrop's fate might hang in balance. Uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, uh, that I had the feeling, and I think it must have probably grown out of the fact that the meeting with Mr. Simon was so, shall I say, brutal, uh, barefaced. So obviously, if you will, a power play that you almost had to assume that uh, he would be prepared to take further steps if we didn't go as good boys and go along. What kind of a contribution would the flying wing have made to aviation if its normal development had been permitted? It was a great load carrier, as I recall. I believe I gave you a copy of NASA letter on this subject, which indicates that NASA confirms our present estimates as to what the airplane will do and considers it a coming design. They said in the fact Essentially what the NASA letter says about an aircraft built more than 30 years ago is, we have, in effect, rediscovered the flying wing. Obviously, we recognize the pioneering Northrop work in that area as an essential source of information. And in the course of our investigations, we re-examined considerable NACA B-35, B-49 wind tunnel data. Our analyses confirmed your much earlier conviction as to the load carrying and efficiency advantages of this design approach and studies performed for us by the major manufacturers of large airplanes have further corroborated these findings. 32 years after the flying wings were destroyed, the Air Force is talking about the same kind of aircraft, the same philosophy of design for the year 2001. The question might properly be asked, how much has military aviation in America been set back by the destruction of the flying wings?
One has the feeling that only the surface has been scratched in the story of the B-49 flying wing. The disturbing fact remains that a revolutionary aircraft design was apparently short-circuited in the development program of American aviation. A design that, in the words of NASA, has only recently been rediscovered and might well represent the next form of large cargo aircraft. There are overtones of politics and big business power plays that appear to have affected the revolutionary aircraft that was the product of the genius of John Knudsen Northrop. The B-49, the flying wing, now little more than a memory. This is Cleet Roberts reporting. And it flew. Oh my, how it flew. <laughs>